It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 126, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of the South sat down across from Solomon in the center of a long carved cedar table directly in front of him. Her maids joined her upon the right and left, while her faithful guards sat to the extreme ends. Solomon remained standing as she and her entourage sat down upon their seats. Solomon, like a well-orchestrated play, held back his purple encrusted robe halfway to his shoulders as he slowly sat down followed by his wife the sister to the queen and his court in order of their importance to the kingdom the queen marveled at the king's presentation and his golden crown one like it she had never seen before its gold crusted flakes seemed to float over his head creating a hallowed presentation what was it made of she considered Gold that lustrous could only come from Ophir. Solomon looked at her and at one of the stewards and back to the queen. How was your journey? The king said as two dozen stewards, each assigned to a specific dinner guest, swiftly arrived and without any noise as a consequence of their custom padded shoes, lowered a solid, freshly made silver plate in front of each person. Solid gold goblets followed in pure silverware, followed in perfect order by the gloved hands of the servants. It was a long journey, she said. I trust you will show me what I have come for. What is it you have come for? The king said with a smile. Many have spoken of you and this place and your God. My father told me of tales of great lands beyond our borders, Solomon said. I wish to learn from you, my queen, but first let me explain to you the mystery of our lands. The mystery, she said. Yes, the mystery of it all. Please, my queen, lift your eyes and behold the excellence of our God. As she looked up at that very moment, at the very instant of her gaze, she looked up to the ceiling and the place of the windows and the 200 gold shields around the windows lining the upper floors of the palace. And at that exact moment, the dawn sun arrived at the perfect moment, peering through the aperture palace windows, receiving a concentrated burst of light, whose design Solomon patterned after the temple. The light careened through the aperture of the windows and reflected off the gold shields from gold shield to gold shield until it burst upon the huge table and freshly created silver plates spreading a terrific light upon the faces of every member of the party. Solomon smiled as light flooded his face from above and below from the sparkling empty silver plate. His smile was eternal, while his wife beamed from ear to ear, knowing the shock of her sister, the Queen of Egypt, as she looked into the eyes of the most enlightened king of all the earth. I trust you will find what you are looking for, Solomon said with a smile to the Queen of the South. What you just heard was a fictional representation created for the podcast. The goal was to try to paint the picture that Solomon had been preparing for this visit for years. In a show of royal power, he had a presentation and powerful message to give to the queen. And in the midst of Solomon's encounter with Sheba, she found his God. But this scene is so much more because it shows the power of God that can be present in the halls of the power of man where godly excellence brings repentance and the knowledge of God. Here's the biblical account, 1 Kings 10. 
When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes as cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. So Solomon takes 13 years to build his custom palace. It's a huge structure. It's actually called the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon because of the sheer quantity of cedar in the place. I mean, Solomon loves cedar and the Lebanon forest. And also, my apologies if I said he made an additional palace previously in Lebanon or he had planned to. It's here in Jerusalem where he builds his palace only. There, was, there wasn't two palaces, but one. And the magnificence of this palace was such that it appeared like a forest in Lebanon. Thus its name or nickname of sorts as the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon. There was four rows throughout the structure and it was 150 feet long separated by three rows of 15 gigantic cedar columns. 1 Kings 10.16 mentions 200 gold shields were hung in the palace. It's interesting to see what Solomon does with his excess gold. He beats it into gold shields to display in his house. Don't get me wrong, it must have been magnificent, but David put his excess gold into the temple to God. Solomon put his excess treasures in his own palace as a display of his own power. There's a clear difference. This reminds me of something. About 15 years back, we visited Colonial Williamsburg in the governor's house. I believe it was the governor's house. There was hundreds of rifles and pistols arranged on the walls in artful designs. I was amazed at this, for each of these weapons alone was very valuable, until I realized what this was. This was an ostentatious display of wealth and power. The governor would host events and hold balls and meetings in these rooms where everyone could see the power yielded by a man who had so much money, he had an armory in his own palace, and so much deadly firepower at his own disposal for immediate use, and the means to create art out of expensive weapons. The message was clearly one of power projection, and the message, fear me. Solomon takes his gold and makes shields with them. Weapons of war made of solid gold. The message was the same. Fear me. It took 13 years for Solomon to build his palace. In the United States, there's a connotation with the number 13 as bad luck. It's an old superstition, and many hotels refuse to have floor 13 for this reason. So when I read this passage many years ago for the first time, it always struck me. Solomon took seven years to build the temple, but 13 years to build his palace. Unfortunately, there is a lot that jives that this 13 years applied to Solomon's palace is not a good thing, and it becomes synonymous with Solomon's eventual decline. In fact, we're probably going to see this scene with the Queen of Sheba as Solomon's high point or high watermark, which means this is the highest place of his physical power as well as the highest place of physical power of the kingdom of Israel. All that was promised to Abraham and fought over by David, Solomon stands at its highest place in this scene. He is clearly on a mountaintop, but at the same time peering down the edge in a severe, steep precipice. As the Queen of Sheba nears Jerusalem, the lookouts report her entourage, and Solomon gives last-minute orders to the stewards and servants. 
He arranges her sleeping quarters, her meals, and everything to the finest detail. What Solomon does is the extremity of the gift of hospitality. Imagine the finest hotel in the world, multiply it times ten. This is the treatment Solomon was going to give to this queen. And combine it with the magnificence and wealth of his palace and his gift of wisdom and the favor of God. Her visit will be spectacular. A good number of teachings have honed in on what they call Solomon's spirit of excellence. In a home, one could call it the gift of hospitality. In a business or political world or even a church-building project, pastors love to call it the spirit of excellence. See, God does not desire perfection, which is works and exhausting, and you'll never get there on your own. But for us to do everything in the best of our heavenly ability given to us by God, that's called excellence. Solomon did this with a palace. He created a massive and incredible structure, which brought all to those who visited it. This was Solomon's pet project, to build a magnificent structure to house God's selected ruler and heir of David's kingdom. What we learn here is that Solomon was extremely detail-oriented and a crazy micromanager when he chose to be, of everything from dinnerware to the construction of the palace. And we can't help but notice that this was all too important to the Queen of Sheba. Everything was important from his servants and their attire, their joy and behavior to the palace and the dinnerware and his wisdom and his worship of God. So where did the Queen of Sheba come from? Well, there's a lot of theories and lots of them. I mean, lots of them. It's a bit hard to research them since there's so many. But Josephus flat out calls her the Queen of Egypt, which makes it easy. And it's why we're going to go with it. But there's a lot of consideration, too, taking her into account that she's from Lower Arabia or Yemen and even Lower Africa. But the most interesting statement, and the one that makes me think Josephus didn't exactly have it right, was by Jesus in Matthew 12:42, when Jesus said the Queen of the South came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. This makes me scratch my head and think she came from further away like India or Southeast Asia or South Africa. Well, we don't know for sure, but maybe it adds more power to it that she traveled from across the globe to meet Solomon. Yet without more detail, though, we'll probably stick with the Egypt storyline, which we've been covering. David Down has a great article on the Answers in Genesis website regarding Queen or Pharaoh Hatshepsut, the female Pharaoh, and how when her father Thutmosis I died, he had had two daughters, one who had possibly married Solomon, most likely, and the other one, had Hatshepsut, assumed the pharaoh role as regent for a while and seemed to have liked the job so much, she forcefully kept the job for over 30 years. And during this time of her rule of Egypt, she comes to visit Solomon. I'll try to post the article to Facebook at some point because it goes into great detail. Well, the Queen of Sheba brings with her immense quantities of goods. In fact, the Bible says there was never such spices brought into Jerusalem. In addition to other goods and gold, Josephus declares there was a particular root of balsam given to Solomon, which grew a tree later for the use of medicine and perfumes and other purposes. But more importantly, she came loaded with many questions and riddles for Solomon. The Bible doesn't record the riddles and questions, but four of them can be found in the Jewish rabbinical Midrash. I don't always research the rabbinical traditions, but in this case, the four accounts of their encounter are pretty fascinating. True or not, here are the four questions from the Midrash of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. It begins with this one. The Queen of Sheba asked Solomon a riddle. What are the seven that issue, and nine that enter, and the two that offer drink, and the one that drinks? Solomon answered, The seven that issue are the seven days of menstrual impurity. The nine that enter are the nine months of pregnancy. The two that offer drink are the breast, and the child is the one who drinks. So you got to think, she took many days to come up with this riddle. 
just to test the king, and he just nails it. Here's another one. The Queen of Sheba exclaimed, You are truly wise. I will put another question to you, and we shall see if you can answer me. He responded, For the Lord grants wisdom. She asked him, How can a woman say to her son, Your father is my father, your grandfather my husband? You are my son, and I am your sister. Solomon replied, The two daughters of Lot, who became pregnant by their father and bore sons. That riddle was interesting because she took a story from Israel's history, and considering it, she took an example of incest just to try to trick Solomon. But he gets the riddle. Here's her third test. When the queen of Sheba saw that he solved her riddles, she brought before him children who were of the same height who were in like attire. She asked him, Distinguish between the males and the females. He made a sign to his servants who brought him nuts and roasted ears of corn which they scattered before the children. The males who were not bashful collected them, tied them up with the hems of their garments, The girls, however, were bashful, since their bodies would not be revealed if they were to tie their undergarments, and therefore they tied them with their outer garments. Solomon told the queen, These are the males, these are the females. She told him, You are exceedingly wise. Interesting, huh? Here's the fourth and final test Sheba had for Solomon. The queen of Sheba brought a number of people before Solomon some circumcised and others uncircumcised. She asked of him, Distinguish between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Solomon immediately made a sign to the high priest to open the Ark of the Covenant. Those who were circumcised stood or bowed their bodies to half their height, while their countenances were filled with the radiance of the Shekinah glory. The uncircumcised, however, fell in their faces, Solomon immediately told the queen of Sheba, These are the uncircumcised, these are the circumcised. She asked him, How did you know? He explained to her, From Balaam, the uncircumcised, of whom it is said, Who beholds visions of the Almighty, prostrate, but with his eyes unveiled. If he did not prostrate himself, he would see nothing. I am also learned from Job, for when the three friends of Job came to console him, he told them, I am less than you. Literally, I do not fall from you. I do not fall like you, for you are uncircumcised while I am circumcised. Well, those are interesting riddles and questions. I can't help but notice that most of them are related to family, indicating that she was very curious this Queen of Sheba, about questions related to family. I like the last one, though, but honestly, I can't imagine Solomon lifting the lid of the ark just to answer her question. But it sure adds flavor and makes for a good story. If there's something here, I believe that through redemption of Jesus, we're allowed to approach the throne of God and bow and even kneel. Yet an unbeliever would not be able to stand because they would be cut to the heart and they would fall prostrate before the Lord as they empty themselves. All right, here's the biblical response she gave to Solomon. And I can't help but reiterate her statement. Indeed, not even half was told me. It's a powerful one-liner. Not even half was told me. 1 Kings 10, 7. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, there's so much to go with in this scene. And amazing enough, Jesus speaks of the Queen of Sheba as he rebukes the Pharisees in his day. Grouped with the men of Nineveh who were saved in Jonah's revival, the Queen of Sheba is referenced as coming from the ends of the earth 
to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Here is the account. Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teachers, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. What I find spectacular is this statement by Jesus implies she was saved. And the Bible documents her account and encounter with Solomon and his God. What this implies is that her salvation was in the court of Solomon. The testimony of a foreign queen coming to know God is 1 Kings 10. Jesus approves of this queen and her salvation and even places her in a place of judgment over the Pharisees at the end of the age. Her salvation moment was before the throne of Solomon when she declared not even half was told me. It's absolutely hard to understand how she'll rise in judgment over the Pharisees one day. I don't even totally understand this. But because of her awe of God in the court of Solomon, she'll be given a place in heaven or earth with Jesus, with the courts of heaven, judging the people who fail to recognize the time of their vegetation at the time of Jesus. In fact, we all, saved or unsaved, make it to see her at the judgment seat of Christ. Could it be her hunger to encounter God in the time of Solomon qualified her for heaven and jury duty at the end of the age and the judgment seat of Christ? Maybe it is she who will have the place to recognize or call out hunger inside those who walked the earth. For she was applauded by Jesus for coming from the ends of the earth to hear Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is here. May we live for him and his glory and seek him out like the Queen of Sheba. Would you travel from the ends of the earth to encounter the greatest king on the face of the earth? The Queen of Sheba did, and she was applauded by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, message to kings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at message to kings at gmail.com.